Yeah, so I, this is going to be a, a, a fairly uh, personal retrospective on, on 10 years of, of doing this stuff. Uh, our shit mostly hasn't disappeared, and, and we're, we're proud of that. Um, I, I like the description of the historian's task as being like uh, driving down a country road at night backwards so that your headlights show you where you've been but not where you're going. You've got a great view of, of the past and no view of the future. And that is useful. The better we understand where we've been, the better a chance we have of figuring out where we're going. So that will be the, uh, the, the theme of, of what I'm talking about. I struggled with the question of, of, I put in a bunch of slides about the most embarrassing moments of doing digitization and digital preservation in my experience. And I really struggled about whether to leave those in, and I did. Uh, so if I skip past some slides really fast, that's what's going on. Um, in our case, we started doing digitization. My, my position was created in 2001 to be half digitization and half uh, uh, various projects related to discovery, stuff that Sam Popovich has now mostly inherited. Um, so we, were, we had the, the Peel bibliography, which had just come out in print, bibliography of historical materials related to the Prairie Provinces. We were going to digitize everything in it. From there, there were some smaller projects before that. Other projects came along afterwards, but we were in the digitization business. We only gradually became aware that we were also in the digital preservation business. And I think that's typical of a lot of projects of, that, of our generation. And uh, I'll be touching on some of the issues that brings. Um, the first problem, the first embarrassing decision. When you start with a print bibliography, you have a number on every entry. So that's great. I don't need to make up identifiers. I've already got identifiers. The Peel number, the Peel 3 number, because there were three editions of the Peel bibliography and the numbers changed in each one. But those numbers are there. I'll use those as we scan things. The fact that those numbers had changed since the previous two editions should have been a warning. Um, and the uh, all the problems that you would expect developed out of this. Here's an entry from the, the Peel bibliography. We will scan this. It will be number 7388, except in the annotations down below, there are three other editions listed, and we may well have scanned one or more or, or all of those. What are their identifiers? Okay, 7388.1, 7388B, uh, and so on. So the lesson and we are still struggling with this. Oh, that's uh, not the way that's supposed to come out. Uh, yeah, there are identifiers which must be opaque. They must not contain meaning. They must, do, they must have no job other than to identify. And then there's metadata, which can include identifier fields that can be PL1 numbers, PL2 numbers, PL3 numbers, or any other number you need. Um, and 10 years later, we still haven't undone all the messes I made uh, by, by that decision, but we will soon. So we start digitizing. We went, we outsourced the scanning. We don't, uh, until recently, we didn't really do any scanning in-house. We uh, contract that out, they scan, they OCR. We get at this time, DVDs full of images and OCR text, and nicely marked up in XML. We did a lot of scanning. We got a lot of DVDs. They went on shelves. They went in boxes. If you look closely, you'll notice, yeah, the box on the right has a number on it, so we've got an identifier there. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, they went into a cabinet, which isn't going to show. The very, it was a very nicely organized cabinet. We reached the point of having about a terabyte of stuff, uh, all on DVDs, all in cabinets. For most of it, we had duplicate DVDs, and they went in boxes down in the vault in the basement of Cameron Library, where they would withstand a near miss by a nuclear weapon, I understand. Um, along the way, we changed vendors. We started getting new formats. We moved from, originally, we were getting our stuff done by the Olive uh, Company out of Israel. 
And then we moved to various other vendors and started getting stuff in, in proper METS Alto. Uh, that, that was a step forward in terms of digitization in that we had METS files for the new items, not for the old ones. We've never really generated our own METS and we aren't really doing much with the METS we've got, but we feel good that uh, if, when we need to, we'll be better off having METS than having something else. Oh, why are my images not coming? Yeah. Well, anyway, it wasn't that great an image. <laughs> so we've got about a terabyte of stuff on DVDs. At this point, we, uh, we were really beginning to understand that digital preservation was going to be something we needed to, to uh, figure out. And uh, as a, a project driven from the top floor, we entered into uh, an arrangement, um, a partnership with Sun and with the Alberta Library, we became a center of excellence. We hadn't actually done anything, but uh, we were in <laughs> Sun's center of excellence program, and this uh, gave us some advantages. We, the, the main uh, thing we noticed, we, we got some uh, very expensive kits uh, at uh, a good rate. We got two honeycombs, which was the preservation uh, platform that, that Sun was, was pushing at the time. We also were involved, we, we joined PASIG, the Preservation and Archiving Special Interest Group, which, which Sun formed, and we were working with uh, people there. We were, we were following in the footsteps of Stanford, who were also uh, using honeycombs, and that made us feel confident. The honeycomb is basically a rack full of uh, servers, each packed with drives, and with its own internal networking uh, that allowed it to do lots of, of internal redundancy among all these different nodes and, and all their drives, and to do continuous integrity checking on everything you put in there. So everything you copied into the honeycomb, you could be sure that if a drive failed, it would be detected uh, early enough, or, or if a single file uh, was corrupted by bit rot, it would be detected early enough that it could be restored from the other redundant copies, and you would never lose anything. I think they. Sun calculated the mean time to uh, uh, actual data loss in a honeycomb was, was half a million years, I think. And we could live with that. Um, but it had other features uh, which did not fit our needs so well. And, and this, as I said, this was a project that, that was top down. The, the technology had not really been considered by the people who were going to have to implement it. And we quickly discovered some interesting consequences of the Honeycomb's architecture. You couldn't delete anything. You can't get uh, space back uh, and without wiping the whole thing. If you, if you put something in there, that, that space is tied up. And this is a feature uh, that is intended for uh, clients like, the, like American healthcare uh, HMOs who have very stringent requirements to maintain data and so on. We didn't have those requirements. We actually like deleting things when we get them wrong, and uh, having, having that uh, uh, as a, a constriction on what we could do was a problem. You also couldn't back the thing up by any internal standard mechanism. So that forced us to put it into a different framework with another Sun pro product, SAMQFS, which is a virtual file system that sits on top of a policy engine. So you tell it files that go into this directory should go into the honeycomb and also onto two tape copies, one of which we send offsite, one we keep on site. So that was great. That meant we did have offsite uh, backup of everything we put in there. It also meant we couldn't use most of the features of the honeycomb because we weren't talking to it directly. SAMFS was, and it had its own way of doing things. So, we moved everything into the honeycomb, and uh, it was at that point, I guess, that we realized we, we were really pretty close to a terabyte of stuff, and that, was, that made us feel good. Um, we learned, uh, at, at this time, we were really, I mean, I, I was trying to professionalize a lot of the ways I was doing things, so getting all my scripts into uh, proper version control systems, uh, getting things documented, still a struggle, getting everybody who works on it to, uh, to, to be cross-trained in each other's work. Um, yeah, that, that is the hardest lesson. 
So we got that far. We had the stuff in there. We had redundant copies off-site. Uh, and then we, we, we really began to realize how, how big a job we were taking on by trying to preserve this stuff. And this, uh, this was Ernie Engel's idea. He, he remembered this passage from uh, the Foundation Trilogy uh, involving the character Ebling Niss. Have you thrown out the old tapes and computerizations? And always he imagined the answer from dusty and ancient librarians. As it has been, Professor, so is it still. We think it is. Scope creep. We, uh, as we got into this, we began moving in, in more and more directions, more and more digital content coming into our purview. We had several projects which involved scanning by uh, Internet Archive, or, or at least in cooperation with them, stuff being uploaded into Internet Archive, and then we would harvest it down again to preserve it locally. So getting into the business of backing up Internet Archive, which at the technical level, seems like an odd thing to do, but at, at the political level, it made sense. So we, if we were undertaking the preservation of this stuff, we really had to have it locally under our control to say that we were preserving it, that we were responsible for it. But it was a lot of stuff. And knowing uh, that, that a lot of stuff is coming is one of the most important things about <laughs> figuring out your technical infrastructure. About this time, the black slides are the ones I was considering coming out. Uh, we were scanning maps, and we had a, a hard drive. This was being done by another unit on campus. Hard drive full of TIFFs of maps, representing uh, uh, more than $1,000, maybe more than, more than $1,000 of uh, scanning time on a hard drive. And I decided to reorganize them before I ingested them. And I wrote a little script that would rename them and move them and so on. And I had a typo in my script so that every file got moved to the same file. It was <laughs> the variable name rather than the uh, actual variable value. Oh, yeah. Uh, I then had to go and say I just lost several thousand dollars worth of files. <laughs> Fortunately, the people who had scanned them for us still had a copy, and so we got them back, and uh, I still have a job. Uh, so the lesson learned, uh, <laughs> yeah, follow procedures. The procedures really do save you from that kind of thing. We diversified our preservation platforms, and I, I haven't been directly involved so much in these, so I, I'm just going to mention them. We got involved in a locks arrangement uh, within the COPAL partnership. We started doing web archiving, again, with Internet Archive using their Archivit materials, and uh, we started archiving data. This was our first foray into, into formal data archiving in cooperation with OCOL and the University of Toronto um, for the International Polar Year data. For that, we went with a product called iRods, which uh, is, is a terrific piece of work. It just didn't fit what we needed to do, and, and we were constantly bending and hacking it. And uh, 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 Steve Marks, are you, yeah, uh, yeah. Steve is killing it, uh, or I, I think it's pretty much driven the stake through his heart already. So we're, we're replacing it with something much simpler. So, don't uh, you know? Don't don't beat your head against the wall. We get get stuff that works. We also began to have to deal with material from outside the library. We had a, a partnership with a local digital humanities project that's uh, at based at the University of Alberta, but with uh, partners all over to um, digitize the research environment or to preserve the research environment that they were building at the time. And this involved us in uh, formats that, that we weren't, that we didn't have familiar, familiarity with. I'd never done anything with TEI. And when I admitted that to them, the, they were shocked that they were dealing with someone who thought he met, dealt with the digital world, but who didn't do TEI. So there was a cultural gap there. The main problem, which we still haven't really uh, nailed down, is that they want, uh, there there's a, is going to be a research environment, it's going to involve continuous commenting and editing and changing and linking between different texts and so on. They want to preserve the history of this scholarly work that's going to be going into it, a perfectly reasonable thing to want to do. We have a platform where we can't delete anything. 
they want to preserve lots and lots of copies of the same thing. Nick and Anna this morning were talking about ultimately having to purge the duplicate copies from their their environment. In our environment, we can't do that without wiping the whole honeycomb and starting over. So there's, a uh, again, a, a clash of, of culture and priority there, which uh, we're still sorting out. So never think that you've, you've figured it all out. Then the honeycomb died. Um, it did not make the half million years. Uh, I, when I say died, I mean it stopped responding. Uh, it is still theoretically supported, but with the acquisition of Sun by Oracle and the end of lifing of the, the Honeycomb product line, we, the support we were getting uh, was uh, not, not something we felt we could count on. So we... Um, uh, basically used SAMFS's ability to specify lots of different storage targets. We, we set up a disk array and made that another storage target and repopulated it, pulling stuff in from tape. And that was great. That was a working uh, test of, of the system. Could we get everything back off of tape? Yes, we could. Except 1,700 files from our newspaper digitization project, um, which were found to be flagged as damaged on both tape copies and in the honeycomb. Uh, we were not sure what, what SAMFS meant by that, but we did know that it, it made it impossible to get them off of tape, at least without a level of forensic effort that, that we weren't up to. Um, we thought they might still be in the honeycomb, but at this point the honeycomb wasn't responding. We finally, through heroic efforts by uh, our sysadmin, Philip Poon, he managed to get it uh, to respond. It would not talk to SAMFS, but we could talk to it directly, and it had an API. Most of that API had been <coughs> sidelined by the SAMFS implementation, but it would still respond to queries by file length. <laughs> so I extracted all the file lengths from the list of missing files, <coughs> It queried them all, downloaded, got a list of every item that was 17,253 bytes, and then I could pull down metadata for those until I found the one that had the file path that I wanted. So I let this run for a week and <laughs> <laughs> got all the files back. So, uh, Peter, where were the file lengths? Where did you get them from? Uh, from SAMFS. It, it, okay. it, it was, its virtual file system still tracked that, and it also had the uh, hashes so I could, I could verify <laughs> files when I got them back. So now we're preserving upwards of 6 million files, uh, almost 23 terabytes within our preservation system. And then there's other stuff in those other systems I mentioned. Um, this is a timeline from May 1990, or 2009 when we turned on the Honeycomb and SAMFS to last week. Uh, and so you can see the, the first bar when the bar first touches the line there, that's about where we were when, uh, uh, when, we, when we went in. That's all the, the original stuff. Uh, a tiny fraction of what we're dealing with now. If I do this, this is by file count. If I do it by stuff, actual uh, gigabytes, you'll see a, a rather severe jump in the middle there. That's when we started backing up Internet Archive. Um, File types, nothing very surprising. We uh, went from using TIFFs as our, our primary preservation format to JPEG 2000s uh, along the way, so that's why we've got both of those going on there. And the zip files, if I go to um, file size, you'll see zips are almost half of what we're preserving. Those are the zipped uh, sets of JPEG 2000s that we download from Internet Archive. So that those are the archival high-res images, taking up about half of what we do. Uh, by collection, our newspapers are the biggest number of files because of the way we uh, insert them into the preservation storage, lots and lots of, of little XML files. But by file size, the, the purple and the green are the two ebook collections that we uh, download from Internet Archive. Going forward, uh, Internet Archive is, 
is a partner uh, uh, for stuff we do uh, as we go along. As we were planning our new preservation storage platform, we looked at what they were doing. We actually we, we created a new position for a preservation specialist and, or a storage specialist, and he and I went down and spent a day there. We got to uh, spend a lot of time talking to Brewster Kale and, and had lunch with the whole crew. We were there on a Friday where they do their whole lunch thing. If you ever need a reminder that this stuff is supposed to be fun, visit the Internet Archive in San Francisco. This is they're, they're housed in an old church, and if you work there for more than three years is it, or five years, you get a statue. So these are, these are employees of the Internet Archive. Um, so take one. Uh, we hired, as I said, a, a storage specialist. He designed a system based on what they were doing at Internet Archive, which was very, very bare bones. Strip it down to the absolute minimum of uh, application on top of the, the file system. So for them, a, a disk is the basic unit. A disk is a bucket. They replicate it. They are sync it. Um, nothing more complicated than that. They, they, uh, they have a few scripts that do integrity checking, and it's absolutely bare bones. And we liked that. We, we had been through complexity with, with SAMFS, and, and simplicity sounded really good. So we designed it that way, and we purchased hardware, and then we lost the uh, storage specialist. He moved on to another position. And that set us back for a while while we filled his position. And in the meantime, we were hearing more and more about systems that we had looked at when we were going down this route that we had decided we didn't want to pursue. Now we were hearing that they were more mature than we had given them credit for. So take two is to take the hardware we purchased for that, that first plan and uh, install OpenStack on it. And we're, we're doing that now. We've got a, a test framework set up and it's all looking very promising. We're only looking at the Swift module of OpenStack, which is the object storage. Um, and we're hearing a lot from other people who are, are going that same way now. So we think, we think we're, we're approaching the mainstream here. We're, we want to manage it using a lot of uh, California Digital Library microservices and, and specifications, Bagit. We're going to use NOIDs as the identifiers, nice opaque identifier. Uh, use ARCs. Fedora to manage everything. We've been using that for our institutional repository, and we know it well. And Archivematica for ingest and uh, uh, general management. Um, it, it, in some ways, it's similar to IROD's in that it's, it's built as a, a cluster of microservices, but uh, we, we, we feel it, it's a much better fit for the way we want to do things. Uh, nothing here is very outrageous, and that's the point. We're, we're getting away from the, the originality thing and going with the mainstream. We also created a position for a digital preservation officer. Umar Kasim uh, is, is doing that. And uh, he is writing policies for us. We were originally intended to go for TDR uh, certification by now. We, we decided that was uh, just too fast. We couldn't, we couldn't make it. But we do, uh, we do want to do the, the things you need to do uh, for that certification just to get ourselves uh, working properly on the policy level. This slide is, is all the policies that Omar has decided we need, uh, and the gray ones are the ones uh, that haven't been drafted yet. And the ones on the right-hand side there are all the technical ones, which I'm supposed to do. Uh. So lessons learned. Preservation can't be done as an extension of something else you're doing. It, it, it is its own beast and has to be treated that way or it will never work. Um, Doing it together is so much easier than doing it by yourself. Uh, and I think the, uh, what I took away from Access a couple of years ago when Beth Sadler spoke was to share everything. I'm trying more and more to do that. We got a GitHub account, which makes all the difference. And we're always putting up scripts and so on. Um, and get ready for big data, because that's going to really change everything. And I would love to tell you how to do that, but I guess I'm just about out of time here. Um, <laughs> Thank you.